Talktainment Radio Worldwide Sound. Talktainmentradio.com. We give you a reason to come. The world's greatest radio. We give you a reason to stay. Radio, the way it should be heard. You got the power. The views and opinions expressed are those of the host and guest and not necessarily those of TalkTainmentRadio.com, the management, the staff, or k e World Network, LLC. This is the Compensatory Concept with Mr. Neely Fuller, heard exclusively on TalkTainmentRadio.com, the world's greatest radio. Radio, the way it should be heard. And now... Mr. Neely Fuller. If you do not understand white supremacy, which is racism, what it is and how it works, everything else that you understand will only confuse you. Only confuse you. Only confuse you. Radio.com, the world's greatest radio. Radio the way it should be heard. Brother K is definitely going to provide all the provocative information that you need to know, along with Brother Neely Fuller. Right here on TalkTainmentRadio.com, radio the way it should be heard. And Mr. Fuller, please tell us more details about the book information that you have to relate to our listener audience this morning. How you doing, sir? Oh, I'm still learning. <laughs> still learning. <laughs> and uh, you wanted to know uh, what now? Good morning, Mr. Fuller. I want to thank Mr. KT for sitting in. I was running just a, just a tad bit uh, behind. We had a couple other things we had to take here. Uh, tell us about your book. Uh, of course, your two works, your definitive works, and tell us about where we can get them and things like that. Mr. Fuller. Uh, the two works are the textbook workbook for thought, speech, and our action for victims of white supremacy. And the uh, basic title is the United Independent Compensatory Code System Concept. Uh, those words are explained in the book. But basically, it's a textbook workbook for thought, speech, and or action for victims of white supremacy. And white supremacy is defined as racism. Racism is defined as white supremacy. Mm-hmm. And a basic book can be obtained along with the additional book, which is a counter-racist word guide, by going to ProduceJustice.com. Mm-hmm. That's ProduceJustice.com. Okay, so there's a lot. Mr. Fuller, of course, we always like to start with you. Is there anything that, before we get into the meat of what we're going to discuss, is there anything that... Uh, happened this past week since we last talked that you would want to uh, comment on? Well, just one thing uh, that I've been noticing for a very, very long time, and people have been bringing it up because uh, a lot of people have called me and they are confused about certain things that are going on in the news, or just about everything, because it seems to be a lot of contradictions going on. And what I try to point out is that the sophisticated white supremacists, the refined white supremacists, that, that's the ones who are really expert at what they do. They are improving their process of contradicting uh, everything. What I mean is, even in what they do, they contradict themselves all the time. And this is to with the objective of causing more confusion, because when you have a lot of contradictions, you have confusion. They do this deliberately. Mm-hmm. Now, how do they do this? They take both sides of every issue. Mm-hmm. In other words, they'll have some segments of them. It's almost like a handshake deal where they'll say, now, when I walk out on the stage, uh, I'm going to take the position that uh, black people should to do something about uh, their 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 situation at home and all like that, and and uh, and so you come out and you take the position of that's not where the problem is. The problem is in uh, the political structure and their local government, and that's where the problem is. So we'll just go back and forth and take up a whole lot of time doing that, like a tennis match. And so the people they will just get tired of listening to both of us, and at a certain point. They'll just go back to sleep. Now, that's the strategy. Mm-hmm. 
And so, uh, in other words, always look for, at any meeting, look for there to be some white supremacists or suspected white supremacists. This is the way that you always term it. Never say that a person is a racist because you can't prove it. But you always suspect that if a person is able to be one, the person probably is one because we are in an entire system of racism. It is the entire government of the world. It's the strongest uh, quote-unquote government on the planet. So you always assume that this government is at work. Uh, government believed in mistreating people based on color. This is the dominant government on the planet. Uh, it's not often called that. It's called by a lot of different names, bigotry, discrimination, uh, on and on and on. But it's basically the system of white supremacy. Okay. So what they'll do at both ends of the table, they'll go back and forth, and the black people who are sitting at the table become more and more confused by all of the intricacies of the argument, mm -hmm. because both sides will be making some points, some of them making sense, and some of them not. So you have confusion, and that'll go on for on and on and on and on until finally the black person who is sitting there trying to figure it all out just says, mm -hmm. well, uh, whatever. Mm -hmm. And so what you're saying is that a lot of people get a sense of not knowing what's going on. It's sort of like the Donald Sterling situation where uh, when Donald Sterling made the comments, other white supremacists distanced themselves and they beat up on him and said, oh, my God, how awful. How awful. This is this this is un, unacceptable. He must. And yet they turn around and they reward racism by <clears throat> turning a 12 million dollar investment into two billion dollars on when it should have been worth maybe 500 million at best. He still would have earned a profit, but he turns around and they reward, <clears throat> excuse me, uh, overt racist statements. Uh, you know, what everybody is, says is an act of racism. They reward this man with $2 billion. I mean, and, and it sets in motion this whole notion that, once again, racism is profitable. Mr. Fuller. Yes. In other words, uh, that that's a scenario that uh, apparently may have a lot of merit to it, because you, when you look for that, that's what you'll find. And you'll find that, well, what's the bottom line? How did it all play out? See, it's almost like a play. I mean, you know, you, you take this script and I'll take this script, and then we'll switch scripts every now and then. I mean, you know, we'll run this past all these uh, black people out here because they don't know what's going on. What do they know? I mean, you know, these are people that we made slaves out of. What do they know except what we tell them? And they're still in that mentality. So all we have to do is just play little games, the same games that we did had when we, uh, when we captured them in the first place and made them under us many, 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 many centuries ago. Mm -hmm. So we are good at this. They don't have any idea of what we do and how we do it. They're looking right at us, but we're hiding in plain sight. And so we just play little games, and they just look back and forth like they had a tennis match. They just keep watching the bouncing ball, the bouncing ball, the bouncing ball. They're not looking at the players at all because they've become mesmerized by the ball itself. And the ball is something that we invented and keep them transfixed on it. They're not really watching us and trying to figure out anything that we might be doing. They're not looking at the big picture. So we always keep them looking at the small picture. That's supposed to be the Negro mind. Always think small. Keep them thinking small so that they never see the big picture. So what they have is what we'll do. Uh, I'll play the bad guy. You know, I'll wear the black hat because they like to use that expression a lot. They don't use it as much now as they used to. Well, they use and the dark the side hat. now. They use, right. they use the term dark every side. Then, and then every now and then, I'll wear the white hat, mm -hmm. and you'll wear the black hat. Mm -hmm. And just keep them confused, mm -hmm. because they're very easy to confuse in every area of activity, economics through war. Mr. And, uh, Mr. Fuller, you, you said something very interesting, and I don't mean to divert and go there, but I think I will. You said something called the Negro mind. Uh, let's 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 expound on that just for a second. That was quite quite profound. 
What is the Negro mind? Well, keep them, keep them busy with trivial things. Uh, the way I capsulize it in the book is that black people have been trained, very carefully trained, to glorify silliness in, so that we're, we're silly about serious things and serious about silly things. See, they do just the reverse. And, and we are trained that way. We are real serious about everything that's silly. We'll go chasing around, I mean, trying to figure out something that's real silly, I mean, in a, in a minute. We're trained that way. And anything that's serious hurts our minds. We don't even want to be bothered with it. Sometimes black people themselves will say, oh, you're being too serious. I mean, you know, come on. I mean, you know, hey, lighten up. Even the terms we use, lighten up. You know, you're too serious. Hmm, well, right. I'm serious about something that's, that I think is serious. You know, well, yeah, but you're too serious, you know. And then when you start talking about something silly, then everybody gets real serious about that. Yep. People who are sitting over on the sidelines asleep. If once you start getting into the silliness, then that's when we come alive. We are champions of silliness. But we're not born that way. We were trained to be that way. Because being serious means you might have to do something that's serious. And and even the word train has animalistic implications. You know, it's like you're training. I try not to use that term because it's like you, when you train, you you know, it's, it's an animal and, and stuff like that. Mr. Fuller, um, a Negro mind, when a Negro mind looks at the world, what does that Negro mind see? What they see is just a very, very small world. One thing they don't see is how the world is run and who's running it ah. and who's running all of their business. Mm -hmm. And like I always say, it's just a simple thing like uh, uh, we, are, uh, we are trained here. Again, I use that word because, you know, you train animals and that's how we are treated. That's we right. always treat it like animals, herd it together like animals. That's right. And, you know, and uh, told what to do like animals, whip like animals. When the animals get out of out of line, what do you do? You whip them. Mm -hmm. I mean, you know, so uh, black people have been trained to watch other black people. Uh, if you just watch most of us, I mean, we're all caught up in that. Uh, we're not interested in anything except what other black people are doing. Mm. And this is a very narrow view of the world. Yeah. See, the white supremacists study a grain of sand. They'll go to the bottom of the ocean and mm -hmm. get one grain of sand mm -hmm. and take it and put it under a microscope. And a black person will walk past the door there, and there's Brian in there in the laboratory, and he's looking at that grain of sand. He's been looking at it for weeks. And you say, what are you doing, Brian? He said, I'm studying this sand. I say, sand? What are you studying sand for? I say, well, I'm, it's because it's there. I, you know, it's, I've never seen this type of grain of sand before. I was at the bottom of the ocean, and... uh I brought this up in a bag, and uh, this type of sand seems to be different from the other types of grains of sand that was around it. So I'm studying it. Well, what are you studying it for? I'm studying it because it's in the universe with me. That's why I'm studying it. You say, oh, man, I mean, get a life. I mean, you know. <laughs> and so homeboy goes on down the hall, see, whistling, you know, and uh, high-fiving. See, because we like that. I mean, you know, but we don't notice a leaf on a tree. We don't notice a bird when we walk down the street. But one thing that we do notice and we pay most attention to, and this is the Negro mind, look at other Negroes. The minute you get another, another black person, in other words, our whole training is when we get a little bit of time off from doing anything, Go look for other black people. When we walk down the street, we pay attention to that black person that's two blocks away. Here's a black person we see on the street two blocks away. Uh -huh. We pass a hundred white people as we move toward that other black person who is two blocks away. But we don't see any of the white people. They're like they're invisible. We pay no attention to them at all. 
And these are the people who collectively are the smartest and most powerful people on, on the planet. They are the ones who feed us, the white supremacists among them. They are the ones who house us. They are the ones who tell us what our education should be. They do it all. Not some, they do it at all. But we are only paying attention to other black people. And so when we finally walk past all of those sea of white faces and get to that black person, Mm -hmm. now we have some conversation. Now we want to measure them up. We want to see what they are wearing. We want to see what they are doing. Well, they're not doing nothing except what we are doing, which is nothing. That's very powerful. And so nothing plus nothing equals nothing. Uh, And then we want to know why we don't make progress. Carter G. Woodson talks about that, something very similar in his work. Um, Let's go. We've got two callers, Mr. Fuller, waiting to talk to you. Uh, Let me take my um, callers in order. Uh, First caller who's been waiting the longest, not the one that just came on the line I just talked to, but the other been waiting the longest. Go ahead, caller. You're on the air. Hey, how you doing? How you doing? Good. This Mm -hmm. is uh, Al from Baltimore. How you doing, Al from uh, Baltimore? Nice to talk to you. I'm doing great. All right. Mm Mm-hmm. I uh, have a comment and then a question. Certainly. Uh, my my first comment is this. Um, I think that we need to get out the business of using the word racist incorrectly. Uh, a racist is a person. And I notice a lot of times what we, we tend to do is say that remark was racist or that statement is racist or these toys are racist, the movie was racist. Mm-hmm. I think that it just... Uh, increases the confusion about racism and the fact that you know you, you, like we had we have like science you'll say you know a uh, person is a scientist or you have art and you'll have an uh, artist but you don't say that that car is artist or that that you know that that uh painting is artist you know so i, I think that it all it does is, is is leads to confusion so i think that instead of saying something is racist you should just say that's a product of racism you know that that comment. That, that man, uh, okay, we're getting we're getting some feedback. Uh, is someone's uh, computer up while they're talking? We're getting some feedback. We got a couple of callers, so just be. I, I just want to make sure that you heard everything that you because I think you're making some very very good points, Mr. Fuller. Thanks. Did you did you catch everything he was saying? I think I caught the the centerpiece. The gist of it. it. Okay, then go ahead, Mr. Fuller. Yes, and uh, I would agree. Uh, like. Uh, sometimes people, black people, will say, well, you know, you know how it is. Mississippi is racist. Well, Mississippi? What's Mississippi? <laughs> no, racists are racist. It's always a person. It's always a person. And sometimes it's worse than that. Black people for years have said, well, you know, America, you know, America is racist. And many people who call themselves black nationalists, et cetera, and, whatever, and they will say that America is racist. There's no such thing. Amer- there is no correlation, no connection between America and the word racist at all. A racist is, like the gentleman said, is a person. America is an idea. Racism is real. And racism is something that's practiced by a person, and that person believes in dominating and mistreating people based on color. That's what a racist is. And the most powerful concept and expression of racism in the entire universe, and has been since the beginning, is white supremacy. So it's a white person who believes in dominating and mistreating people who have dark skin. And these are the smartest and most powerful people on the planet. And so that gets your focus. That gets your clarity. Because if, when you don't have focus and clarity, you have the other thing that's opposed to it, and that's confusion. And that's what we started off this segment t- this morning about, talking about this confusion. The races thrive on confusion. And they thrive on confusion in all nine areas of activity. Economics, education, entertainment, Labor, law, politics, religion, sex, and war. Right now, in this morning's paper, they're talking about Los Angeles and the school system. And you have, here again, some confusion about 
the teachers and whatnot and how they're going to treat the teachers. And, you know, and maybe next year about this time they'll swing back if I know how the races operate to the extent that the races has something to do with it and they have something to do with everything that has to do with black people or non-white people, then they'll swing back and they'll say, oh, no, let's, let's, let's swing it back like it was. Uh, we made that mistake. I mean, you know, we went in the incorrect direction last year. Let's swing back in this direction this year, and on and on and on. And right now, all over the world, they're causing horrendous confusion in the eighth area of activity, sexuality. They're pouring it on, and it's successful. I mean, they're parading in the streets and whatnot, and they're saying, oh, this whole thing about black people wanting to be black males walking around talking about being men, being men for what? I mean, that's no goal. That's shallow. I mean, you know, you know black male, you know, why not just morph into anything? I mean, you know, uh, be like your sisters. Uh, degenderize. We don't need any genders anymore. I mean, you know, uh, gender is like racism. See, see how the racists do it, how they play it out? They'll say, hey, you know, we shouldn't abide people by racists. We're not. People are just people. And they're correct there, see? And that's how. That's another racist strategy. That is, they will say something that is true and then turn right around and in the next sentence say something that's false. That causes confusion. Well, because the average person will listen to that and they say, yeah, this thing about dividing people in racists don't make sense. And they'll say, sure, it doesn't. Never did make sense. But it's here, and we should get rid of it. Now they're saying this thing about dividing people according to sexuality doesn't make sense. I mean, you know, into just two categories. I mean, and if you're going to have racial categories, have a lot of them. We started out with three. Now we've got 21. Next year we might have 50. And the year after that we might have 120 different categories of race, more confusion. So they're doing the same thing with the sexuality. Male and female, that's not enough. I mean, let's add a couple of more. Transgender, bi, okay. Now, no, no, hey, that's just four. How many we got now? But Mr. Oh, Fuller, hey. Mr. Fuller, you said some time ago that they would make the face of this gender confusion black and uh, on Time, the cover of Time magazine, I think it was last week, the cover of Time magazine. I don't know if you had a chance to see it, Mr. Fuller, but if you go on the net and any of you who have a chance to watch Time magazine, I mean, to look at the cover, on the cover of Time magazine, a full picture, full, I mean, from head to toe, of a black male with a blonde with blonde hair streaming down like Marilyn Monroe in a dress and high heels. Under the caption, transgender. I don't know if you've had a chance. On the cover of Time magazine, black male. Same thing with the NBA. Same thing with the NFL. And and more and more. Same thing with the young boy who wanted to be prom queen. More and more and more. All of it's tied to black. Mr. Fuller. And you said that. And they are taking, it's, it's, taking, it's becoming the, the, the centerpiece of the school system. See, and they're going to shift it slowly but surely into where the black people of this planet are the heavies in that particular role. Because it started when they started seeing, during Martin Luther King's day, black males walking around, because black males have always been struggling to be recognized as men. They were walking around with signs saying, I am a man. Now, if you're already a man, you don't need to have a sign expressing it. But see, we have been boys for so long. We say we'd like to try a hand at being men. Please, let us be men. Let us be able to take care of families and whatnot. Let us be able to step forward on the world stage and do something that makes sense. I'm tired of being called boy. I'm tired of being called boy. But the white supremacist said, oh, you don't want to be a boy. You can be a girl because you're not going to be a man. Not any of you. You're football players or nothing. I mean, you'll just be big boys. We have always allowed you to be big, strong boys. You know, hey, boy, come and lift this. Tote that barge. Lift that bale. We don't mind you having muscles and whatnot. Like a man. 
you know, being strong physically. But when you're being strong mentally and physically, can't allow it. There's only one man in the house, and he's white. So now if you don't want to be a boy, you keep crying about it century after century, you don't want to be a boy, you can be a girl. And pick your choice. You can be some type of sassy girl, black girl, put some earrings on, you know. Always keep those little earpieces, if that's the fashion, for females. And make you get a truckload of hair and put it on. I mean, you know, if you don't, it won't grow that way naturally, uh, just come and borrow some from us, if necessary. And just add it to what you got and let it hang down your back, you know. And then you put some heels on. Now you're good to go. You know, put some lipstick on, and uh, hey, now, you went from boy to girl, but you will never be a man because on this planet, in the system of white supremacy, and you're black, you're never supposed to show any signs of manhood whatsoever. Now, if you're going to show signs of mental strength and physical strength, then you have to be some type of monster. And we don't mind you having the image of a Mr. T or something like that, somebody who's all ready to tear up something. But don't look like you're going to build anything. That is reserved for white men, Aryans, wow. Hitler, Superman. Mm -hmm. All right, let me go to my second caller. Second caller, the one who hasn't had a chance to ask the question. First caller, stay right there. Second caller, you're on the air. Go ahead. Go um, ahead. <clears throat> yes, go ahead. Speak up. Oh, sorry. I... I live in I live in South Africa currently. You live in where? Um, but I'm sorry. Did, wait a minute. Wait a minute. I'm sorry. Where did you say you live? South Africa. South Africa. Okay then. Go ahead. But I did spend a lot of time in Washington D.C. Uh huh. I wanted to ask Mr. Fuller because uh, maybe a couple of shows ago he made a statement that I thought it didn't sound like a statement that he would make. He said that black people were that were that they were sexual that they were very sexual, and that's something that white supremacists have uh, sort of um, played like they they have used that to their advantage and to 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 do this sexual confusion. So I was wondering if you know along with this sort of like Negro mind and sexual place, have they turned us into these sexual beings, or were we? Sexual, and they just change us into something else. Okay, okay. I think I got what you're saying. You're saying, uh, Mr. Fuller, I believe he's saying, were we? are you saying were we turned into these sexual beings, Carl? Is that what you're saying? Uh, were Carla? we turned into what? Wait, I'm trying to reach him. Carl, no, you still I, there? I was asking. Yeah. Okay, okay. Tell I me, think, what tell you... me, tell me, wait a minute, hold on for a minute. Tell me what you're asking, Mr. Okay. Fuller, because because I'm trying to get clarity on it also. Go ahead. Mr. Fuller was he said that black people were were very sexual, and that this is something that the white supremacists have preyed on to create this sexual confusion. Okay. So I was wondering if I don't know if that was if maybe it made a mistake in that comment. Are we sexual? Are we very sexual? Are we more sexual than other people? Or or and have white supremacists preyed on this, or is this something that has just? Or, was that a statement that he was like really making? I think he he said something like that. We were very sexual. Okay, I don't. Uh, do you remember making that statement, Mister Fuller? This was you said a couple of weeks ago. Uh, yeah, no, uh, all, all all people. Okay, Mister. Uh, have sexuality, just like all creatures, all organisms, because that's how the reproductive process takes about. So you know. All, all creatures uh, who reproduce, uh, anything that reproduces is, is sexual. But what the white supremacists do, not only in sexuality, but in every area of activity, uh, education, whatever, if, it's, if it involves non-white people, they want to cause confusion. See, this is what it's all about. They, they will look at what people do ordinarily, and say, now how can we distort it? How can we cause confusion among them if they are people with color in their skin? Black, brown, red, yellow, anybody who's not classified as white. So the white supremacists go and 
make a study or they just do observations and whatnot. Say, what are they doing? Well, they are doing this. They are doing that. And they are doing this in education. They are doing this in labor. They are doing this in sex. They are doing this in their religions. So how can we jump in and distort it and get control of it? And by having control of how they go about doing whatever they do, we're controlling them. And we will dominate them forever as long as we can get control of the way that they go about doing things. So we will steer their minds the way we want their minds to go, and then their bodies naturally will follow. And then we have their minds and their bodies, which is the whole key to dominating people, minds and bodies. And then when we get it off and running, we don't even have to stand over them with a gun, which is what you have to do when you can't control somebody. You have to watch them every minute. See, we don't want to have to do that. And we have just about perfected the technique of not having to watch them every day. They do our bidding even when they don't know that they are doing our bidding. I mean, even when it comes to warning things, we tell them what kind of shoes they should be wearing. We tell them what type of clothes they should be wearing. We tell them what they should aspire to buy, and they will... We will set the price in such a way that it will take them almost a lifetime to buy the things that we produce. And that way we know just how much money they have to have because we are the masters of money. Even when we allow them to have tons of money like we are allowing a lot of them to do, we get it all back anyway because we are the masters of money. And... We're the masters of money because we are the masters of them. So anytime you control a person, you control whatever that person has. So all the black people out here who are the growing number of billionaires, and there will be many, many more in the field of economics, because that has to do with money and time and energy. The white supremacists are now in the process of dumping huge sums of money on many dark-skinned people all over the world. But they will control the money because they control the value of the money. Money has no value except when the white supremacists say that it has value. This is why in places where black people have their own banks, you might say, and all like that, that doesn't mean anything in the long run because the white supremacists will walk in and declare all this money null and void in your bank. Mr. Why? Because I said so. Mr. Fuller, stay right there. Call us, stay right there. More to come. This is the Compensatory Concept with Mr. Neely Fuller, Jr. I'm Brother Kahari sitting in every week. Stay right there. More to come on TalkTamingRadio.com. TalkTamingRadio.com is the premier Internet radio platform offering 40-plus talk radio-style programs professionally produced, optimized for online distribution, featuring Columbus, Ohio, on-air personalities. TalkTamingRadio.com offers listeners diverse programming options covering topics such as arts and culture, love, life, and relationships, technology, religion, paranormal activities, local and national politics, women's issues, alongside health and wellness. Listeners can access their favorite TalkTainmentRadio.com programs free of cost through the website. Download the TTR app to your cell phone and you can take us wherever you go. We have programs on demand to fit your schedule through our podcast. The address is TalkTainmentRadio.com. Have you ever wished you could spend more time with your kids or maybe quality time with your spouse when you can actually have an uninterrupted conversation? Do you owe your dad a little catch-up time? Well, it's time to reconnect. And no activity can bond a family together quite like boating and fishing. I mean, think of all the great experiences you had as a kid when you went boating or fishing. Well, guess what? It's still great. Boating and fishing are the perfect opportunities for your family to get away, to talk, to laugh, to create new memories. So take someone you love out on the water and see where the water takes you. If you haven't been on the water in a while and you're not sure where to start, or if you just like to have some helpful tips for your next trip, please visit TakeMeFishing.org. 
This has been a public service of TalkTainmentRadio.com. Radio, the way it should be heard. The United Independent Compensatory Code System concept by Neely Fuller is considered as one of the substantial and basic books for understanding and effectively countering racism. Neely Fuller will turn upside down everything you've heard and everything you think you know about racism and how it works. Call area code 202-484-5461, 202-484-5461. For information on everything from passports to driver's licenses to local weather, go to firstgov.gov. Firstgov.gov, the official source for federal, state, and local government information. Are there hidden sex words that impact your brain? Are there secret images and symbols that manipulate and control your child's mind and behavior? Why are so many youth unable to resist the destructive sexual messages beamed into their brain without them knowing they are being manipulated? Do you want answers? Get the new book, Sex Code War by Kahari and Ahara, coming soon. Years ago, identical twins were separated at birth. Chris Paul was destined for life of basketball. Cliff Paul was destined to become a State Farm agent. They shared one invaluable trait. They were both born to assist. Find an agent born to get you to a better state. I think I'm entitled. You want answers. I want the truth. You can't handle the truth. You got the power. This this is the compensatory concept with Mr. Neely Fuller Jr. Heard exclusively on TalkTainmentRadio.com. Radio the way it should be heard. By the way, if you can't catch us right now, you can catch us at today at 3 o'clock, 3 p.m. We replay what we've done uh, live. We're live now. We replay it at 3 p.m. Then we replay it again at 10 p.m. All of this is Eastern Standard Time. That is the United States time for Eastern Standard Time. As you know, we have listeners all around the world. We have people calling and just had a uh, uh, um, young man call in from South Africa. So we get callers all over the world who are following what Mr. Fuller is saying and doing. And uh, also, we um, uh, you can and if you miss those two uh, broadcasts on Wednesday, you can always go and hear Mr. Fuller 24 hours a day, seven days a week uh, and do his podcast a podcast or simply a sophisticated word, pod, which is interesting, birth or something, I don't know. But anyway, I think we need to study that word also. But um, it's a rebroadcast of shows that have previously taken place and the dates on them and the subject matters. So you can always uh, pick that up and hear it. And, uh, uh, um, and of course, there are other ways this thing gets out there that, of which we have no control over. We've tried to control it, but... Uh, you know, we try to get the word out, but you can get Mr. Fuller's works at www. I'm, I'm sorry, www.producejustice.com. Producejustice.com. Please go get the works. Very, very definitive. Whether you agree or disagree, at least it is thought provoking. It gives probably an outline of what things are, the shape of things, and it gives you at least a point of reference to begin to look at what's going on from a whole different perspective. If you haven't seen that perspective, it'll be a, it is surely an eye opener. All right. Um, uh, Mr. Fuller, let's take some calls. Uh, we've got uh, two callers on the line. Let's go to the, the caller that just came in. The one who had, uh, well, let's go to the one who's been holding longest. There's one that's been on the line a little longer. Let's go to that caller. Caller, you're on the air. Call you on the air. Go ahead. Whoever's been holding longest, not not the one that just came on, but the one that's been holding uh, for a little bit for a while. Go ahead. You're on the air. You're on the air. Hello. So, oh, yeah. Go ahead. You're on the air. Okay. Um, my question is, um, why do many black folks think that? Where are you? Um, where are you? Uh, where are you calling from? Uh, New York. New York. Okay. Great. Go ahead. Um, why do many black folks think that they're in control of their own destiny instead of um, recognizing that they're dependent on others? 
That's an interesting question. Let me repeat that and see if I get it right. Why do most black folks think that they're in control of their own destiny as opposed to the reality that they are dependent on other people for which way their lives go and their destinies go? Is that correct? Correct. Okay, Mr. Fuller? We've been taught that. We're told that. I mean that's that's an assumption that's not an assumption we just made based based on evidence. Those who say that we've been taught, you know, you hear it all the time. You're in control. You're in control. You can be anything that you want to be. Anything that you want to be, you can be it. And that may be theoretically true. But if you're black and you're on this planet, you're going to have to deal with the white supremacists in anything that you want to be that's worth being. Now, anything that's not worth being, any any type of silliness, any type of foolishness, any type of dangerous activity, anything that's tacky or trashy or terroristic, you can do that because that's all been authorized. But anything that's going to be constructively productive in a concerted way, in a focused way, in a clear way, in a steady way, the white supremacists will come around and say, oh, no, <laughs> if you're going to do anything that's a real improvement, something that's really a breakthrough and really constructive, you're going to have to get my permission to do it, and I ain't giving my permission. And if you don't like it, fight me. I'll challenge any of you because I'm an expert at violence. You people think you know something about violence on the south side of Chicago. Have you ever seen me when I really get in a violent mode? All of you black people all over the planet, you think you know something about violence, you get in my face. I invented violence. I'm the master of violence. I teach violence all the time. I teach it to you. The AK-47s that you have, you get them from me. And don't you forget it. You're totally helpless when it comes to anything in economics, in education, in war, trying to run a family and whatnot. You don't have a family. I'm in charge of your families. I'm in charge of your entire village. I'm in charge of what you call your entire country. I run everything. You don't move on the ocean without me, without my permission. Mm -hmm. I know where you all are. I mean, I have planes in there all the time that can watch watch you when you're trying to uh, uh, put a needle, uh, put some thread on a needle. I know when you're doing it because I invented the thread and the needle. And even if I didn't invent it, I took it over. So don't start talking to me about your inventions either because whatever you have, I have because I took you, which means I took everything that you have including all your ancient knowledge that you claim that you have. And so this is why in in the book that I wrote, I say black people shouldn't brag about anything. We should be out of the bragging business altogether. I mean, I mean, like almost forever into infinity because we have lost everything if we ever had anything worth having. We have lost it under the system of white supremacy. We are not in a position to brag about anything. And when we do, we come in a, we come under that silly ban- banner. Because the white supremacists would look at us and say, what are they parading about? What are they bragging about? Look at their condition. Look at the condition of, of what they call their families. Look at, they beg us for everything. They're not in charge of anything. Not one thing are they in charge of. But they have time to brag. We have really done an excellent job on them. Let's keep doing it. Okay, let's go to the second caller uh, who has not had a chance to ask Mr. Fuller a question or to make a comment. Go ahead, second caller. Second caller, go ahead. Yes, 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 you are. Go ahead. Sorry about that. Oh, okay. Uh I'm, I'm calling from Colorado. I finally got through. Oh, yes. How are you? I got your email, too. Thank you so much. Okay, I, I'm doing well. And okay, it's it's good to uh, get a chance to speak with you, Brother Kahari, okay. and you, Mr. Fuller, this morning. Uh-huh. Um, I had uh, actually two questions, but I know time is an issue. No, no, I'm no. You, you you've one. been waiting for about three weeks, so go ahead and ask your two questions. <laughs> <laughs> 
the, well, my my first question is, and it's actually related to what you were saying earlier, Mr. Fuller, about um, black males not being allowed to be men. Um, so if, if I, as an individual non-white person, am down here in my daily life following the code, is there anything that I can do to be constructive on behalf of, say, a, 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 non, a non-white male that I may interact with, whether I say to him, hey, this is what I'm doing, or I'm just doing it because that's what I want to do, you know, to be constructive as a person on the planet. Is there anything that I can do, uh, uh, you know, not that following the code is easy and that I've got it down, I'm not completely codified, but do you get the gist of my question? Yes, ma'am. It means how do we interact with each other? That's basically it. Yes, sir. And an excellent mm-hmm. start would be just four questions that we should ask each other and ask ourselves each and every day, all day. Now, these are not in the book right now, but I'm in the process of updating the basic book. And these four questions will be in that book. And that is, what do I want to do? That's question one. Question two, why do I want to do what I want to do? Question three, how do I plan to do what I want to do? And this, and then if this is the clincher question, number four. What do I expect the constructive result to be? Now, that's a question you ask yourself, and that's a question you ask any black male that you interact with. Ask him, what do you want to do? Because everybody wants to do something every minute of the day. I don't care where you are on the planet. If you are any kind of organism, if you're in the form of a person or an animal or an insect or a bird or whatever, you want to do something every day, all day. So the question is, what do you want to do? If you're sitting and talking to the gentleman sitting somewhere and having dinner or whatever, you ask him, what do you want to do? What is the thing that really on your mind that you want to do more than anything? And then why do you want to do it? That's question number two. Why do you want to do what you want to do? There's got to be a reason, so give me the reason why you want to do what you want to do. And then number three, well, now, if you want to do this and you got a reason for doing it, how do you plan to do it? That's question number three. How do you plan to do what you want to do? And then last but not least, and this is the clincher, this is where it might even involve you, what do you expect the constructive result to be? And underline that word constructive. In other words, if you're going to do something together, the one thing that you want to nail down with that gentleman is this thing that we're going to do together. What's going to be the constructive result? Because all results are either going to be constructive or non-constructive. That's any move that a person makes all day long. If you're sitting and having a meal, that meal that you are eating is either going to have a constructive effect or a non-constructive effect. You might have to go and get some antacids or something like that, or, you know, after you have that meal. Why? Because the ingredients in the meal made you sick mm-hmm. or put on more weight. That's so any move that you make is going to be constructive or non-constructive all day long. So getting back to the gist of your question, any interaction that you have with the gentleman that you're talking to, these are just what you might call civil questions, civilized questions. Mm-hmm. You're getting right to the point real quick when you find out what is on his mind and why it's there and what's going to be the constructive result of whatever it is that he's thinking about. Because he's talking about wants. You're talking about wants. You're talking about your wants. You're talking about his wants. You want to find out if whether or not both of you want the same thing. You're on the same page. And so it's a fast-forward way of getting right to the gist of everything. 
and that can spread to any conversation that you have on the job with anybody and whatnot. A person just sitting there and just talking and talking and talking and talking in the lunchroom or whatnot, or at the desk next to you, and they're just talking. You can just ask them, say, wait a minute, wait a minute. What is it that you want? More than anything, when you're sitting by yourself and thinking about your wants, what is it you want more than anything? And why do you want it? And how do you plan to get it? And what do you expect the constructive result to be? And that applies to everything from, you know, buying a house to the teenager out there on the street who's got a 9 millimeter gun in his belt. Mm -hmm. And he says, what I want to do is find me somebody in a a new car, and I'm going to carjack them. That's what I want to do. And I plan to do it. Why do I want to do it? Because I want to get the car and ride around in it, or I want to sell the car and make me some money. That's why I want to do it. Now, how do I plan to do it? I plan to do it with this 9 millimeter. And what do I expect the constructive result to be? Now, that's the clincher question to anybody listening to what I'm saying right now, because somebody out there is getting ready to carjack somebody right this minute. Now, what does that person expect the constructive result to be? Because that's a business, and most likely it's not going to have a constructive result. It's going to wind up being a great big disappointment and a whole lot of tragedy for all involved, which I would recommend that this is not a constructive plan. It's it's something that somebody wants, but it's going to end ugly. Hmm. And for the person who thinks they can get ahead by doing it, it's going to end ugly because how many cars can you jack as a business, because that's what it is, it's a business, before you wind up in big trouble or dead. Okay. Mr. Fuller, let's let's go to her second question. Go ahead, caller. My second question is, uh, it's in relation to, uh, it's something I've heard you say in in different broadcasts about uh, under no circumstances should a non-white person ask for an apology. And I I feel like I get the basis for, you know, why that is part of the code. But I read a, an article. It came out at the beginning of May. And if you've already spoken to this, I apologize. But I haven't heard anything that you've had to say on it. The, the article, uh, The Case for Reparations, that came out in the Atlantic, and it was on the cover. And I, I feel like it was it was such a, a powerful, moving article, and um, I, I, I do apologize, but I just want to read this. It says, it says, the case for reparations, 250 years of slavery, 90 years of Jim Crow, 60 years of separate but equal, 35 years of racist housing policy, until we reckon with our compounding moral debt America will never be whole. Now, my question is, in making a case for reparations, does that qualify or could that be seen as a way of asking for an apology? I mean, in your in the in terms of the code, do you feel like um we as non-white people like that that's a constructive activity to be involved with like very good question you know, mr Fuller. you never you never you never ask anybody ever ever anybody as long as you're on the planet or in the universe for an apology for anything an mm-hmm. apology is means absolutely nothing if you have to ask for it mm-hmm. if you've ever had an experience with an apology the only policy apology that has value is when the person walks up to you Someone that you know who has done some offense to you and whatnot, and that person walks up out of nowhere and say, "You know what? Three years ago, I said something to you that to you that I shouldn't have said, and uh, I would like to apologize because it's been bothering me all this time." Now that's when an apology is worth something, as far as the words are concerned. Now, as far as the treatment of non-white people by the white supremacists in all of these many hundreds and hundreds of years, uh, 
apologies out of the window. I mean, you don't even think in terms of an apology. <laughs> uh, you know, it's not a verbal thing at all. Anytime mm-hmm. that they want to do something about that, it means they have to replace the entire system of racism with the system of justice. And that is the repair work. Like we, for years, we've been saying, well, we want reparations. But we usually think of it in terms of we, we want some type of cash payoff. Because black people are very, very, you know, sensitive about cash. Because we know that cash, we, we say that cash is king. In this particular case, that wouldn't work. If you're talking about all those years and whatnot, no. We want, when you say reparations, I use, I use the term compensation. It means a long-term process, because it was a long-term process that we have been under racism. So that means you want the basics, and you want it right into infinity, because we have been working this thing called racism practically into infinity. So that's a long period of making up for what is missing, compensation. So that means the educational system, the transportation, the housing, and the health care. I call it the big four. So you don't want money. You want the things that money will buy, and even the things that money can't even buy, really, you know, if you start talking about a long-term process. You've got to repair. When you say reparations, you're talking about repair work. You can't just slap something together with some cash and call it square. No, you're talking about a long-term program. And, and definitely not some verbal apology. I apologize. Or I apologize for my ancestors and all like that, and then walk away. No, absolutely not. You're talking about guaranteeing that every black person has a roof over your head. That's number one. I mean, for several generations, you have to guarantee that. Why? Because you took away stuff for many generations, uncounted generations. So you have to guarantee the things that you took. You took away education, the ability to get an education. We're still arguing about education even now. You know, how many black people are you going to educate and how are you going to educate them? What are you going to teach them? And then when they learn what you teach them, how can they use it? Where are they going to use it? That's being argu- arguing, right? Uh, that's a big argument right now that's going on in 2014. We shouldn't be having this argument. It shouldn't even be a discussion. Every black person that walks out of a school should know exactly what they're going to be doing and how much tons of money is going to be coming in as a result of doing it. Rather than wandering around, I mean, wondering where they're going to get a job or how they're going to pay off a student loan. This is absolutely horrendous. This is terrible when you think of it in the perspective of everything that's been taken. So, no. An apology? No, absolutely not. We don't even know what that is. We're talking no about repair attack. work, a huge no, it, repair it, uh, uh, program, a program that just you? goes on and on and on and on and on until you make uh-huh. up for everything that you took, uh-huh. centuries of everything that you took. Okay. So what I'm hearing you say, Mr. Fuller, is we should be very suspicious of anyone that steps forward and suggests, here's a check, and, and it would be in your interest to take it. That be in the interest of what now? a white person or a non-white person. She said we should be suspicious of anyone who steps forward and says, in that context, here's a check, mm-hmm. and you should you should take it. That's what she's saying in terms of reparations. Oh, no, exactly. no, no. I mean, they'd have all that money back in about five years. I mean, just just picture mm-hmm. black people walking around with all that money that's been dumped on them suddenly. Uh, I can mm-hmm. see a lot of black people now, I mean, uh, renting uh, stretch limousines with white chauffeurs and then shooting out of both windows from the back of the car, <laughs> right? You know, that, that would never work just, with us. I think about the words of Dr. Bobby Wright. Uh, out of Chicago when he said you, we should beware of any black politician who steps forward and says, I have the answer to all of black people's problems. Wow. And so in that spirit, whoever would step forward and say, 
here is a check that we really need to be suspicious of whoever this whoever is. does it. All right. Thank yeah. you so much, caller. Uh, thank you, Mr. Fuller. We appreciate you as always. Thank you for calling.